want to emphasize the most is that she is an engaging and knowledgeable speaker in her field. And I have to put all the cards on the table. I am a proud member of her family. She is one of my cousins uh, on my father's side and is has entered into a profession that so many in my family have entered into and has graciously agreed to participate. So welcome, Dr. Laurel Bradley. Our next panelist, if we could have that slide, please, is Dr. Lakonda G. Ambrose Fanning. And she is a licensed professional counselor licensed in substance abuse treatment. Um, she is also a registered nurse and she holds a doctorate degree in clinical psychology from Regent University. In October of 2020, Dr. Fanning joined the Eastern Virginia Medical School's graduate med medical education team as the director uh, of their mentorship and assessment program. The early assessment and mentorship program offers a unique support structure to medical residents, and Dr. Fanning serves as the diversity and inclusion educator for the Graduate Medical Education Office, where she spearheads this uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion DEI initiatives in collaboration with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. In her continued pursuit of scholarship, Dr. Fanning has participated in Harvard Women's Leadership within the Higher Education and Yale School of Management in diversity, equity, and inclusion. She received a certification in that. Dr. Fanning has a special interest in health disparities, religious coping, and the generational effects of trauma. She's been invi an invited panelist for the Association of American Medical Colleges, Women of Color Working Group, as well as a host of many other things. And she is an active advocate of the Virginia Counselors Association and serves on their executive committee. Let us welcome Dr. Lakonda Ambrose Fanning to our team. Thank you. I, I want to um, also, if we could move to the next slide, I, I want to really emphasize that this particular discussion, and let's, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this next discussion is really um, about this urgency of now. That is our theme today as we look at black health and wellness. And future editions are going to look back on the past, look at the myths, the stereotypes, the behaviors, the practices of the past, as well as talking about empowerment and practical action steps we can take today. We'll cover a few essential historical facts impacting health and wellness, and we'll focus largely on current issues, the history that is happening right now as we speak. And we hope that you'll find this event meaningful and helpful to you in your health and wellness journey in your community. And so our next step is to really uh, begin to look at where we are. Um, and I just want to make a note that we are recording this session. And so we hope that you will continue to participate in our discussion. Next slide, please. Um, we want to also take a moment to thank um, our partners uh, who have made sure that we have knowledge about the Princess Anne County Training School and Union Kemsville High School. Uh, their museum has reopened for visitors. And if you have not had a chance to go into uh, that particular museum, please do so. It is an important um, view and insight and lens into the history of our community and the history, especially in Princess Anne County. Next slide, please. Now, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Stephanie, who's going to give us a, a few tips about our webinar etiquette. etiquette excuse me. 
Thank you, Dr. Nubi Alexander. Um, please, if you have questions for any of the panelists at any time during the presentation, enter them into the Q&A tab. We've disabled the chat for ease of moderation, and um, we would appreciate if you would use the Q&A. Um, please keep any comments and questions short and on topic. Uh, and um, please refrain from using any profanity or in, inappropriate um, language. If you per do that, I will have to remove you from the webinar. If you are having technical issues, please fully exit the webinar, close out your browser, and then come back in through the original link that you use. I unfortunately will not be able to provide IT assistance uh, remotely while I'm managing the back end of the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Richmond. Next slide. I want to provide us with kind of a, a framing of the information that we're going to talk about today. And I thought it would be good to start off with a few statistics that some of you may or may not know. Just some quick facts on African-American health. For example, 18% of the adult population among African-Americans are listed as in fair to poor health, almost 20%. 19% of adult men and 12.2% of adult women who are African-American smoke. 38.7%, that's almost 40% of adult men and 55.9, almost 56% of adult African-American women are classified as obese. 56.8% of men and 57.6% of women have hypertension, high blood pressure. And 14.5% of all African-American adults do not have healthcare insurance. Now keep that in your mind as we go through some of the statistics. So what are the three top leading causes of death right now among African-Americans? The leading one, heart disease. The second, cancer and the third, COVID-19. Next slide, please. So some other quick facts. Some of the statistics reveal um, an, a whole host of, of racial inequalities in healthcare that not only reflects a legacy of racial discrimination in our healthcare system, but also some, some behaviors that we see um, that are governmental related that impact the health and well being of African Americans. For example, 58% of all African Americans as of 2017 live in the South. And yet, it's in the South that the majority of the Southern states uh, who, who are politically conservative refuse to allow the expansion of Medicare. In fact, the, the state that has the highest number and percentage of African-Americans today is Texas, followed by Florida and then Georgia. And those are the three states that absolutely refuse to expand Medicare. And of course, with that statistic, that high statistic of African-Americans not being insured, it has a direct impact on their health and well-being. Now, because of residential segregation that was put in place by law by the early part of the 20th century, the majority of African American, um, African American and Hispanic areas are more likely to lack hospitals and other healthcare providers. In 2018, for example, there were almost 18,000 geographic areas and populations identified in our country as not having enough health healthcare providers. And and most of those geographic areas included a majority of African-American and Hispanic peoples. Next slide, please. Now, some other quick facts. Black infant mortality rate is 250% higher than that for whites. Blacks are more likely than whites to suffer from cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. And the diabetes was the one that followed um, uh, COVID in terms of being one of the highest percentages. And of course, we know that diabetes and heart disease are interrelated. 
we know that black mothers are at least three times more likely than white mothers to die in childbirth. African-Americans have the highest rates of post-traumatic stress disorder and African-Americans are more likely to die prematurely from all types of disease. And so much of that is the result of two things. One of them being that they are not, um, they don't have healthcare insurance. And so they're less likely to uh, get uh, uh, their, their health care needs addressed. And the second thing has to do with how they are treated by many health care providers who still have a lot of, um, of perceptions, cultural perceptions about Black health. And therefore, they're often not given the treatment that they need. Next slide, please. Now, the social determinants of health this concerns how equity of access is measured in the healthcare field. And so what are some of the social determinants? Education, understanding how to relay your healthcare needs, how to relay what, however you feel. Healthcare access, um, and that of course includes access to primary care physicians, as well as healthcare, excuse me, healthcare literacy. A third social determinant is economic stability. Of course, that includes employment, food security, and housing stability. A fourth determinant is the environment. In fact, in our region, there will be a program tonight on one of the news stations talking about the environmental impact on your life expectancy. And we're seeing that there is a direct correlation between the environment and your life expectancy based on what kind of zone you live in. Do you live in a ground zone? Do you live in uh, a zone where the, the, the air is filled with certain types of contaminants? And finally, the social and communal factors. These have to do with discrimination, incarceration, as well as social cohesion civic participation, and a general sense of community. So next slide, please. All right, so let's go to our, the theme of this, and that has to do with uh, our urgent issues. And before we dive into that, we have a poll. And Stephanie, could you tell the audience about this poll? So we have a couple of polls for you today, uh, and we're going to ask for your input. What do you think the most urgent issue uh, is about health today? So please select your answer in the poll. It's anonymous, uh, and we'll share the results at the end. And please, as many of you as possible, uh, answer the poll for us. Want to try to get 100% participation, so we are going to leave it up for one more minute. Okay, you can, all right, so we'll leave it up for about 30 more seconds while I continue our discussion. So, some urgent issues. I'd like to start our discussion uh, by asking um, Dr. Laurel Bradley, this issue of mistrust and misinformation, can you tell me a little bit about why that is an urgent issue? when it comes to African-American healthcare? Thanks for that question, Dr. Nubi Alexander. Um, so I think that there is, well, there's actually studies in um, lots of literature that confirms the mistrust has to do a lot with um, not only historical um, experiences, but also um, personal and communal 
experiences that the African American community has had with um, their all of their encounters with the um, the healthcare industry. So you know. I, there are plenty of discussions about how historically um, we have been abused and used as st in studies without our permission. Examples being Henry, Henrietta Lacks um, um, family using her cancer cells um, as a we, um, turning them into cells that we use for research now for cancer. And a lot, I mean, I actually use Henrietta Lack cells in trying to do experiments while trying to learn about how to do things about set, learning about cells and how they function with research. And this family, it, they, that has earned millions and millions of dollars. And to know that the family has just not be reimbursed, that's horrible. And they finally have found out. And not only that, but the first um, OBGYN physicians were um, practicing these horrific um, experiments on women, just cutting them out without anesthesia. The idea that they're um, African Americans generally are seen as not having as much pain as their Caucasian counterparts. Um, and then, so historically we've been mistreated. So that is a definite underlying state for the mistrust. And then another reason is for personal experiences. Many times when we go to physicians or healthcare providers that don't look like us, we're not going to actually have a communication experience that is well understood. And so many assumptions are there and it's not necessarily always being taught in um, education, medical education on how to understand cultural competency and how to um, give the best care to patients. Um, and it's a little bit different. Um, and, and it's not only just within the community, a lot of times people may have a personal experience with um, mistrust that makes them just turn off altogether healthcare. The problem with it is it delays care. And that's why we have those poorer outcomes with um, when we're um, having things like diabetes and cancer because we're diagnosed um, a little further in the more severe stages of the conditions. Misinformation is, horrible at this point in time in the state that we're in um, in the political environment that we're in because that misinformation is built upon the mistrust because many people don't trust the physicians and the healthcare providers because of the con conceived influences um, by being money um, being insurance companies, being pharma, pharma, big pharma, as one will say, many will say, think that, you know, we're just after dollar and chasing after dollars. So we don't, we're, we're holding back information. And so it has created many platforms of pseudoscience as well as pseudo medical treatments in all realms of um, diseases and including diabetes including heart disease, including, of course, COVID-19. So we're in a significant pandemic, if you will, of misinformation and disinformation. And mistrust has been, um, it, it's, it's not just a pandemic, it's been historic. Um, and so these are significant areas that um, we need to address and have some solutions for so that they're built, we can rebuild trust and then give correct information that people are willing, open and understanding in a clear communicative way so that they can really bond with it and partner with a trusted healthcare provider. Uh, so that those are all things that are urgent issues at this point in time. So we will be delving a little bit more into some of these issues and how this misinformation um, is causing um, all laypersons to think that they are healthcare experts. Uh, and that leads to even more misinformation, but we're gonna delve into that in just a little bit. This next uh, issue, I'm going to direct to Dr. Fanning. And I'd like for you, Dr. Fanning, to speak about this history of societal medical abuse. Uh, Dr. Bradley touched on that um, as one of the contributing factors to the mistrust, but I was hoping that you could give us a, a little bit of a deeper dive into why is this such an issue today? 
this is extremely significant, you know, kind of conjoined with uh, the information that Dr. Bradley shared on mistrust and misinformation is recognizing that in the medical uh, community and even and from education to research uh, to instruction to curriculum development, there are uh, inherent biases um, that again, that has shaped how even physicians have been, have been taught. Uh, recognizing that how African-Americans have been treated and been the source of some of, some of the most horrible uh, experiments uh, is significant. And they, they have again, begun to dictate the narrative uh, for uh, this community and not just this community, but African-Americans in general. And so you, there has been a foundation that has, um, again, kind of permeated uh, unnecessary fear uh, and uh, uh, access to issues. And remembering that um, African-Americans by nature of the culture and our cultural trauma, that we have not, again, you're asking us to trust someone that has never been seen uh, as a partner uh, of our health, a partner uh, in uh, our wellness. And so and again, it's much, much larger now than just Henrietta Lacks or um, the Tuskegee experiments, uh, because we continue to experiment uh, on an individual level and a collective level, still some remnants of medical abuse when you have uh, access to care issues and you have issues with uh, health insurance and, and medical coverage. And uh, when you have evidence of the health disparities that uh, you recognize uh, in the statistics, that this continues to be something that, although uh, the narrative may say historical, uh, we continue to experience uh, examples on different levels uh, when it comes to uh, our medicine and our, our health and well being, even now. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to kind of pull in two of our partners, Mrs. Margie Cofield and Mrs. Edna Hendricks, uh, to talk a little bit along with our two physicians, Dr. Bradley and Dr. <laughs> Fanning, about the issue of healthcare deserts and lack of access to healthcare and healthcare providers. And so, um, uh, um, Mrs. Cofield and Mrs. Hendricks, can you speak about your particular experiences with these issues growing up in what was formerly Princess Anne County, but is now um, Virginia Beach? Hey, this is um, Marjorie Wilson Cofield. Good morning, everyone. Good, morning. Good afternoon. Uh, one concern that we um, that could be a question would be, what is being done in order to help to ensure healthcare coverage for all people of color? Because that is what has existed when we were growing up. How do we afford that? Because many people cannot afford it, right? Because economical conditions that exist. So how can they be able to afford those particular coverages? Also, um, how do we reverse the concern about uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, because I can remember uh, my niece having diabetes. And sometimes when she went to the physician, she might have felt that she was not being treated appropriately. And sometimes she may not have opened up in order to talk about her diabetes. So those, those, those are just the beginning of some of my concern. And then uh, we don't really look at um, our eating habits. Uh, many times our eating habits may affect our health. And I guess that goes back to our grandparents and our great grandparents, So, which means we have not been educated. So what can we do in order to educate the public so that they do not, those situations do not exist where they get diabetes or high blood pressure? Uh, so those are the concerns. Um, what can be done to ensure health care coverage for all? And what the effect does it have on people of color? and how they can get the medical coverage. Uh, this is um, Edna Hendricks. I, I wanna also mention that in the early 1960s in Princess Anne County, uh, there were no doctors. And when I grew up, we had to go to Norfolk even to see a dentist, to see, um, even for our hair, um, if we had skin problems, 
no doctors would know about the early 70s. Um, the only thing that we had in good state values for doctors were midwives. And midwives, um, some of them would go if they have medical problems and the midwives would say, you know, help them with a cold or something like that. Um, I did some research and there was a doctor that came in 1930s. Can you imagine this? 1930s. And he rented a room and everyone in the community, uh, they spread the word that he was going to be there that day and families came to seek health care. So for so many years, the African Americans had no access to health care. And when they finally did, uh, a lot of them attended um, the only white hospital that was in the area uh, because there was no hospital for us except for we had to go to Norfolk again for Norfolk Community Hospital. But at the white hospitals, we were in the basement. So treatment didn't come accessible to African Americans in Prince Dane County until the late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. Also, I can add that uh, when Mrs. Hendricks brought up midwives, uh, we have a group called the United Order of Texas. And um, during that time, uh, which was formed in 1867, and they train individuals to become nurses in order to care for those who were ill. And some of them worked along with the white doctors. But also, those ladies were also midwives in order to go into the community to help those individuals. I remember Mr. Reed, my band director, telling me that Ms. Cora Wilson, my grandmother, was one of the, the midwives. And I remember also when I was a little girl, my mother had to take me to Norfolk. And when my sister and I were hospitalized one time, we were in the basement of the Virginia Beach General Hospital. We could not be up on the floor where the whites were. So that lets you see also the situation that exists at that time. So the point that you two bring up, and Edna, I'm sorry that you're having some audio issues right now, um, mm -hmm. because you did make some really important points about um, lack of access uh, for many people who were growing up and living in Princess Anne County and later on in Virginia Beach. Uh, during the time of segregation, especially when African Americans uh, had a hospital in, in uh, this part of Hampton Roads called Norfolk Community Hospital. On the peninsula, they had um, Whitaker Memorial that became uh, Newport News General Hospital. Um, and then, of course, you had some smaller uh, hospitals or clinics uh, around, but they were few and far between. And today, um, we have the Sentara system and we have uh, Bon Secours system uh, and a few other smaller, um, although it's difficult for the smaller or privately funded groups to survive the, the corporate onslaught of healthcare providers. And this has limited access for many people. They have to travel um, sometimes upwards of 15, 20 miles or more to get to a medical facility or even to uh, the closest um, physician. And so I want to kind of um, pull uh, doctors Bradley and Fanning in on this to um, tell us, you know, why is it then uh, that these issues of, of a healthcare desert or lack of access um, is really an urgent issue? Well, um, I can answer um, just kind of, of a global reason why and just experiential for the Northern Virginia area as well as the DC and uh, Maryland. Um, I think there was a question in the chat as to whether um, we are expanding Medicare, Medicaid. And that is a yes with Virginia, um, there is expansion there um, and there are um, enrollments as well as going to medicare.gov and Medicare medicaid.gov and I'm looking it up, um, dmas.virginia.gov. 
gov discusses in detail the Medicaid expansion. Now, those are um, wonderful that the money is there, but is that is it being as, accessed um, accordingly to the need? Because a lot of times to qualify, there are lots of high standards to qualify for those um, for that as well um, for for the monies that are made available. Um, as um, Dr. Nubi Alexander described. And so, um, and then transportation is a huge barrier for care, um, not only just to see a provider, um, and we're very thankful for not just um, physicians, but our physician extenders, including nurse practitioners, midwives, um, physician assistants, because they play a significant role to be able to deliver care to the community. Um, and having the systems like Centura and Bon Secours are awesome. But as she said, having those smaller areas taken care of, like, you know, can you go to the corner or take like just one or two buses to get to um, a center or even a drugstore, a pharmacy, that's huge. I've been in deserts, healthcare deserts, where um, particularly in the District of Columbia, where there's no way, um, you know, accessing that care is available. So you just kind of sit there and let things really get bad. And your primary care is the emergency room, which is not ideal. And that type of thinking has to be completely squashed, but we're not doing enough within, um, government and it within the healthcare system to actually support that ability for those that are disenfranchised and um, those that are really not available um, to have those resources. Because if you think about it, you have to have the bus pass, money for the bus pass. And if you're having one of those social determinants of health that um, Dr. Nubi Alexander described where you're choosing between rent, electricity, water, and food, and then here comes healthcare, there are priorities that you have. So it's no wonder why things stay the way they are. And people are arguing against, um, they're about against being, you know, it's unfortunately it's policies. I will say policies at this time that are things that need to be implemented to change. So I would actually encourage everyone that is on this call to register and vote so that policies can change so that we can actually implement these types of things when they're carried out. And administration has changed in Virginia and there are threats to the access uh, and expansion of these things that have been federally mandated and available, but it won't trickle down, quote unquote, to the lo local areas like Princess Anne, where there's you have to take maybe a few buses and you have to go into Norfolk. That's a significant, um, barrier to access. It won't trickle down if people don't vote and don't have information to, in, to be able to properly implement the policy so it doesn't get swallowed up because those bigger organizations, they know how to write for their money. They know what the key words are to get it. And they will just have, they just check, check, check off lists um, so that they keep the money. And that's the system, it's designed that way. Um, and, and they'll have a couple of um, things like federally um, mandated healthcare um, um, quality um, medical centers, um, FHQA, where some physicians that are really just physicians from the heart will just take a quarter of a pay to be able to um, be able to deliver care. And, um, you know, so there, there are lots of factors that um, contribute to the healthcare deserts. And, um, and I think that um, dissecting lack of access is huge. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that as well, that um, right now we're in a time where there's many, many types of insurances. I would even um, ask in reference to not just the underserved that may have to benefit from um, Medicare or Medicaid, but many people uh, don't know uh, what insurance actually covers. Uh, and they assume that, so it's a definitely a knowledge deficit, uh, access deficit, but all of these complex levels kind of expand the disparity in healthcare from 
even knowing and advocating who is your, um, who is your congressman, right? And, and making them aware uh, so policy change can continue uh, and these issues can continue to stay in the forefront. Um, but also to um, knowing your health insurance and knowing that you do have a voice uh, and uh, know what you are actually uh, paying for and what's covered, but taking the uh, a, a little accountability just to again, become aware of that. We're in a major time where many um, people that pay for health insurance uh, don't know was covered under that plan uh, and that the employer um, may change their plans uh, and increase the deductibles of, uh, uh, of the health plan without even the employees being aware, right? And so most people know that they get a new insurance card uh, every year uh, or every two years with the update of your deductibles uh, and, and the changes in the amounts from uh, specialties and what's not uh, non-specialties. Uh, but knowing your deductibles uh, and right now, uh, many, many people, uh, especially if you are a uh, single and you carry insurance right now, your deductible may run you three to uh, $5,000 a year before there's even any coverage by a governing or organization. Uh, and so being more aware of uh, and getting the information and knowing how to ask the questions uh, before a crisis occurs or before you need to to use it and to see even when it comes to uh, having a primary care who is your service coordinator uh, and knowing how to ask the right questions to make sure uh, that you get the service that you need. And so healthcare is a major, uh, major issue uh, and a major platform, but know that you do have a voice and, and again, recognizing and getting information on how to get the information or ask the right question. And you can just start with your, your HMO as a source of information for you. Uh, so you can get the information that you need, uh, especially when it comes to access. And so these accessible issues and the insurance issues uh, is not just one group of people. This is everyone uh, who has to utilize uh, health insurance as a part of a treatment and care. So Dr. Fanning, what you're really talking about is not just a lack of access, but a lack of access to knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. about the healthcare industry. And that really leads us to this next point that many of you all have already um, uh, uh, kind of touched on. And that's the issue of, you know, let's look back for a minute to look forward. Um, we have seen, for example, a lot of incidences of discrimination in the healthcare industry. African-American bodies have been used and experimented on for years. In fact, there are many stories uh, about what happened with um, the Medical College of Virginia, for example, in the antebellum period where African-American women were experimented on. And so we would see the evolution of of C-sections and hysterectomies and so forth because of the experimentation that happened with black women's bodies or amputations with and without um, any kind of anesthesia, um, always on black bodies, whether these individuals were alive or dead um, and often on elderly people uh, because they their bodies were not seen as important anymore to providing money to owners. And of course, as we get into the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the ongoing use and misuse of African-American bodies for healthcare benefits at the same time, excluding African-Americans from, from um, uh, remedies to their diseases. Uh, since the 18th century, we know that uh, the Western world uh, would publish reports talking about how Africans uh, or people of African descent were both uh, predisposed to being sickly as well as strong and so therefore didn't need the kind of health care that whites would need. Um, we would see this idea that continues to exist and we see statistics that show this that Black people somehow are um, uh, stronger than white people can take pain more. And as a result, 
um, uh, we would see the mortality of African-American women giving birth uh, at a higher rate because there's less of a proactiveness. And so I want to throw this out first to Dr. Bradley and then to Dr. Fanning about, you know, how can the lessons of the past inform us today about what are some of the issues? Because right now we're issue oriented, we're talking about the issues, but then in just a, uh, a little bit, uh, we're going to talk about solutions. So Dr. Bradley. Thank you, Dr. Nubi Alexander. Um, thank you for the, the history walkthrough. Um, I, and I see in the chat, someone mentioned um, digging up the graves of black people um, just to also do the experimenting upon. So yes, you also mentioned, um, and I say that you mentioned um, those that were not alive. And I say that because it's about our voice are we able to advocate for ourselves? And in this day and age, even though there may be people within our neighbors and all of that that might not see us as equal, we are equal. And we have a responsibility to feed ourselves the empowerment that we have deserved for centuries. And in that vein, these types of webinars and the types of seminars and everything that Dr. Fanning and um, Ms. Hendricks and Ms. Cofield are discussing, learning what's going on, that type of, um, it's rage that, you, that we experience, but how do we utilize it instead of just being mad? So realizing that you have just as many rights to go and say, I can change my physician. I can change my health care because the deductible is too high. And then call the 800 numbers. And if you don't like how they sound, hang up and call again. It's that noisy, we, this is squeaky wheel that he gets what they need. Um, and I know I'm saying the thing wrong, <laughs> the voice wrong. How, um, the, the squeaky wheel gets oil. But, um, you know, so many times it's because of our lack of um, our tim being so timid. Um, and when we say I'm black and I'm proud, the pride should mean that we also have and we're empowered. Um, a solution is also getting not only just being responsible for the knowledge, but also perhaps seeking to have somebody that you know has the knowledge, um, an advocate. If it's a friend that you know that's a nurse or a medical assistant or a physician or a nurse or has some medical knowledge, they can be a representative for you. Run it by them. I can't tell you how many times friends, family, they will FaceTime me, text me, from some of them from abroad. And they say, well, I have like my doctor on the phone. And that just kind of raises it up another level so that people are paying attention. Um, so that use your resources that we're out here um, and want to make sure that, because it's about this community, um, you know, connecting us with the community so that we really advocate. Um, and, and we have to advocate for ourselves. Those of us that have got received the education, we did it specifically because we have the communities and we personally have experienced the type of discrimination that we have had. Um, so it's, it's really important because, you know, a lot of times, um, it, it's hard to, um, again, the trust factor, the misinformation, those are other things that we really need to touch upon. Um, and I'm gonna allow Dr. Fanning to um, go ahead. I mean, if that's okay, Dr. Nubia Alexander, I, I can be so loquacious, so. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm just gonna add, you mentioned something that's near and dear, and that's recognize your level of empowerment, recognize that you do have a voice. Uh, in uh, your health care and in your wellness, but take a step towards your own well care plan. Uh, if if uh, I asked uh, who was a trusting person uh, in your environment that you trust, because uh, it starts there, you know, to mitigate trust and to mitigate your, your wellness is to start with someone that you trust. Uh, take someone with you uh, to the physician, uh, if you have one, if not, don't be afraid to ask questions that you don't know. 
Right. Don't be afraid because usually we'll ask, but then we may get discouraged. And sometimes because of that, uh, that myth of being strong, uh, we won't say, I don't understand nothing that he said. You know, I was on a panel yesterday and uh, one of the gentlemen said, when I went to the doctor and he said, um, um, your a one we need to do your A1C, right? And so he immediately shut down. I was like, what, you know, what is that? Why, why do you have to do an A1C? But he would not go the extra step to say, I really don't understand uh, what you're asking. And that piece right there is uh, attached to our level of trust and the mis mis and the misinformation. And so we have to, again, reframe, take a step to know that you are in power, we do have a voice, uh, and uh, go back, find that nurse, as Dr. Bradley mentioned, or that trusting person, or that person that you value their opinion. And even if they can't find the answer or have the answer, they can help you navigate the system to find a resource for you. Okay, and, and that is, that's the beginning step is how we do and gain knowledge, uh, but we have to challenge our own level uh, uh, when it comes to healthcare, you know, and, and it used to, again, um, I spoke the other day about values, beliefs, and tradition. So again, just pushing beyond what I'm told from my parents or the insurance man, I call it the insurance man mentality, what said, that's it, you don't question, right? We are beyond that. And so we have to, again, re-script the narrative to one that it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to get information or to access it. Uh, and so um, just kind of think about that, but knowing your personal history, connecting with not necessarily your provider, but a person that you trust that can become an ally or advocate for you. Thank you. You know, I'd like to have us uh, to do our second of three polls. Uh, so if you would take a minute to just answer this uh, poll about trust. And Stephanie, could you tell them a little bit about this? So we're just asking to, to take the temperature of the room here and we want to know, do you trust your healthcare providers? And we just kind of gave you a scale between not at all to absolutely. So please uh, pick what you feel think feels best. And as you all are completing the poll, um, I just wanted to move forward um, and, and really kind of give a comment about, you know, this whole idea of looking back to move uh, forward. Um, a lot of times uh, people have said, um, you know, the past is the past. Why are we talking about the past? That has nothing to do with me today. And of course, the past has everything to do with you today. Uh, when we think about um, the first time we go to a doctor's office and we have to fill out the thousand and one forms, what is the one form that comes first? Asks about your family history, your family medical history, because history does matter. But in order for the doctor to address your current needs and your future needs, they need to know what happened in the past. They also need to know what you've been eating in the past. What kind of, of uh, health care have you had in the past? Have you had injuries? Have you had certain types of conditions? Do you exercise regularly? Do you have a healthy lifestyle? Because that impacts your current and potentially your future health care needs. And so but there are some other things um, that we are uh, having struggles with, and, and that has to do with this next point, and that is combating myths and, stu and superstitions about health health care and, and uh, uh, what the, the, your health is all about. In fact, one of the things that uh, is our biggest challenge today has to do with all the so-called experts we have on COVID-19. And yeah, I'm going to just start that conversation right now. Um, and, and there are a lot of myths and superstitions going on today. One of them has to do with um, the, the vaccine has some sort of nanotechnology that's tracking you. 
And, um, and that's kind of humorous to me because when people are saying that, they're saying it on their phones. And their phone is the main instrument for tracking everything that you say and do. And people aren't realizing that or not understanding that. But what are some, some myths and superstitions that, that you, Dr. Bradley, and you, Dr. Fanning, have, have encountered? And, and, and this is both in terms of our medical health as well as our psychological health. And I was wondering if you could dive into that. What's amazing to me, I'll start there, is just the impact of the myths. Uh, and then I share a few that I, I have experienced uh, in, in, in my daily work. Uh, but what is significant about that I've heard, regardless of how much evidence that we visually have had from um, the deaths and the sickness, and even with the experience of people in our inner circle, the myth is still extremely powerful when it comes to influencing your decision-making, whether to get vaccinated or not, or whether now you even get your child um, vaccinated. And so I think it's uh, extremely uh, relevant, like Dr. Alexander mentioned, to mention the, the power of the myth from uh, the nanotechnology to uh, you, I, I wasn't aware before when you mistreated my people, but I'm aware now. So there's this extreme cultural paranoia about harm. And, and there's a, a irrational fear uh, of being harmed. Uh, and something, even though you can see the actual evidence uh, of harm that may even jeopardize our life, uh, but that fear from the past uh, and those experiences that we have had to endure has left a powerful historical narrative that fuel um, these myths. Uh, and so it does, it does sometimes um, take panels like this and speaking with the person individual to help you challenge those beliefs. Uh, and help. And I, I always uh, talk about, uh, we take medicine all the time. You know, we take medicine all the time, but this is a life-sustaining measure. Right, and we're not talking just about a Tylenol, we're talking about a life-sustaining measure. Uh, and so really begin to think about that. And so uh, the myths, uh, many, many myths, but that's the main one of there is a cultural paranoia that I am gonna be harmed and that you are gonna intentionally uh, try to harm me and my family for generations and I'm not gonna participate in that, right? And so it's this protective factor uh, and sometimes they can't give you the argument. Uh, and this is not, this is, you know, I got a lot of even colleagues that I, that I work with where their husbands and their adult children are like, we're not going to do that. Yeah, we're just not, right? We got to get more evidence. We got to get more information. We got to watch and see what happens in the community, right? And so again, this is where we are. And that's why information and accurate information regarding COVID uh, is extremely important. And when we see the systems like um, NIH, you know, and we see the CDC having conflicting information, it does not help uh, our underlying suspicion. It kind of validates the, the irrational thought because it is irrational. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Dr. Fanning. I'd, I'd like to talk about some of the myths that I've experienced. I do holistic and integrative medicine, and so I do serve a population that is vaccine hesitant, vaccine resistant, as well as um, want, um, dealing with the immune system, because that's what a lot of the myths are based on, and particularly in the African-American um, community, it's a concern about being experimented on, which has trickled down into um, some of the other types of communities like Caucasians um, and the mothers and um, those that are also now becoming vaccine resistant and hesitant. So some of the myths have been as, um, you know, that the once you get the vaccine, if you put a magnet on there, you'll be able to be tracked that way. Um, in two, there've been prophesized um, through religious leaders that in two years, all that took the vaccine will 
will be dead. Um, that the RN, that what this messenger RNA technology is going to incorporate into your, um, your DNA, which is different than RNA. And so that's going to harm you. And also that the that vaccine is too new and we don't have enough information. So let me address those. The one thing about, let me say what about messenger RNA and the nanotechnology. It's called messenger RNA because that's what it does. It's sending a letter, a message, an email to your immune system to say, hey, hey, alert, alert, you're gonna see COVID-19. Here's a little something that we need you to start revving up so that you can fight against it. So you're, it gives your body the ability to have um, things that can recognize when, you actually encounter the um, COVID-19. So that's what messenger RNA and nanotechnology is. A, it's a 20 plus year old technology, so it is not new. The thing that is new about it is the specific SARS-CoV-2 um, SARS vaccine or COVID-19. Um, um, which is a virus. They've been using it in cancer technology, but it's been used in other forms of um, SARS um, and, and um, coronaviruses. The other aspect of it is um, it does not track you, just as Dr. Nubia Alexander said, there's not, you know, they have the ingredients right on every website you can take that is validated. I'm talking about don't necessarily go to Dr. Google. Dr. Google is going to give you a whole lot of stuff. You go to NIH, CDC, the, um, the, those are two very good uh, um, resources for people to go to. Now, the, uh, the issue about it being too fast, too new, and I'm an experiment, it actually has been fast-tracked, and it's been under the emergency use um, authorization because of the volume and because of the money that's been put on, it's allowed for there to be a shortened amount of time for the vaccine to be pushed out. And because there were so many people on the initial types of um, the initial um, studies, um, they they did amazing studies, and it just had so much evidence of something that, that would be helpful that that's why it got pushed out so far ahead. Now it became a bit of an issue because it was being held back from. African American communities when it was like just rolling out last um, oh sorry rolling out last um, spring um, you know because we had a government mandate for that we had people from other communities coming into those that were given to the African American community and taking the vaccine. Um, it was disproportionately actually affecting African Americans because of our physiology, our genetics, our health overall, because we do tend to have things like vitamin D deficiency because of our darker skin. Um, you saw that we are um, at least 50 plus um, percent obese, and that's a factor because it's an inflammatory thing. Many of us have heart disease, and it also has to do a lot with inflammation. So these types of things, beware of. And it's hard, so hard to trust the what the federal mandated things and government are. And what you do is, again, we're getting back to trust. Find healthcare providers, people that you know that you trust because you don't want to get COVID and you don't, and it also has to do with, say you have diabetes, diabetes, you know, sugar diabetes. And I've gone, I'm very religious and go to church all the time. And I've heard, I, I will take, you know, things like, and don't take this out of context, you know, but, um, you know, Jesus is going to heal me of that. And the next thing you know, you're getting amputated because it has not been controlled. And so, when I, one thing I'd like to suggest that would be one of the things that can help when you go to the doctors, if you have questions, write them down. It speeds up the process and don't, don't get your questions answered um, so that you can, uh, what is, just like what Dr. Fanning was saying, what, what is a hemoglobin A1C? What does that mean? What does that test, you know? Um, make sure that you're getting taken care of. Um, and, it, and it has a lot to do with us being mistreated within the community. The superstitions are amazing. I'm talking amazing. And there's a stigma attached to having disorders and disease. Um, stigma still with cancer, stigma with mental health, stigma with COVID. Um, it's huge. 
Um, so not just superstitions, but, you know, you're not taking care of yourself if you actually get this, you know, or suck it up. We've never had that problem. You know, we're strong enough, particularly dealing with mental health. Those are factors that are um, extremely important to kind of dispel, dispel these myths, dispel the rumors, destigmatize, meaning don't make it weird, don't make it abnormal, because right now in this age, because we, we had to do that stigmatizing to be stronger because we didn't have the access before. We have it now, it's being underutilized. And it needs to be, we just, we have the right and we have the responsibility and we have the power to implement them within ourselves and within our family and within our community. Um, thank you both for looking at that question. You know, it, it reminds me of um, something I've been looking at, um, taking a really deeper dive into, into why it is that African Americans are not passing on um, the, the history, the, the experiences that they've had um, to their children so that their children are aware. Um, I have encountered uh, families who, who had members back in the 19th century during enslavement who somehow managed to escape slavery and live as free people. And uh, a century and a half later, their family doesn't know anything about it because that information was not transmitted to the next generations. And part of that, I believe, has to do with trauma, has to do with not wanting to relive that trauma, passing that, because it's been generational trauma. And people have said, you know, they've tried to compare African-American trauma to the trauma of Jews during the Holocaust. And the two are not the same. Um, the, the Holocaust was something that happened during a very fixed period of years in, in uh, both Germany, Austria, and some of the other Eastern European countries. But slavery happened over a period of hundreds of years, and it was generational. And it was not something that happened during war. This was something that was a, a, an instrument of, of commerce and empire that was utilized to enslave, and I should say use the the bodies of millions of people as slaves to build colonies and later nation states. Very different situation. And so as a result of, of um, this trauma that we see that's ongoing among African-Americans, this knowledge of your personal family healthcare history is also not being passed. Um, and I was wondering if you all, all of our panelists, can briefly speak to that issue about why this is an important and urgent issue that you know about your personal family healthcare history. So not everyone speak at once. And so perhaps we can go to Dr. Fanny. Yeah, I'll, I'll start there. I, uh, uh, this, is, this is my perspective, especially growing up in Virginia. I think that uh, I am um, blessed uh, in regards to, and I know that's a religious word, but um, in regards to knowing my family of origin, um, knowing my, uh, from my slave background to where my family name came from, uh, to where uh, my grandmother uh, uh, coming from as a Blackfoot Indian and knowing the story. Uh, and so my identity uh, is a uh, really much set and just having that strength in who I am. Uh, but that's something being able to have a foundation of those stories and things that are pa uh, passed on are significant and be what becomes a priority and your focus in who you are, uh, including health, including uh, being able to make decisions, including to being able to empower yourself. Uh, and so I think it's extremely difficult when uh, you have a history where er everyone as an African-American, where your family has been intentionally broken uh, and 
uh, you got to know what to pass on. You always don't want to pass on the bad, not knowing how to differentiate the bad. You know, if I mention anything about being African American, what hot was highlighted the most within my family uh, is things that are harmful and hurtful, right? And so uh, I think that's part of the issue um, that you mentioned with the generational trauma uh, and how do you uh, find the resilience and the strength that's also, okay, very much so a part of the African-American experience. How do you find those stories uh, in your family? Again, so you can also kind of mitigate change and the scripts that you know. If you ask anyone past for one generation, uh, and sometimes two, uh, who were those family members? How powerful, like uh, Dr. Newby mentioned, Dr. Newby Alexander, about being able to make it through slavery uh, and what that means, right? And what kind of strength that is in your family. Uh, but being able to take the initiative to change the narrative, that takes time. And that takes a person who's commit, committed to changing that, that again, that may not have to uh, always remember the harm, right? And so I think it's very important uh, for family to even talk about that. When you're at your dinner table, uh, it's very difficult to, to talk about a narrative that's positive. Right. And that's not our day to day survival. You know, one thing that influences African American families and our ability to pass on information is if we look at uh, it's this um, hierarchy called Maui's little hierarchy of needs. For African American families, we are always in the near bottom of those needs and meeting our physiologic needs and our financial needs and our health needs. Uh, and so we can't meet, even really get to the next level because we always are permeated. And can you think about always the narratives that I, that I have is always uh, depressing, right? And so uh, it takes time uh, to rebuild the story. Slavery is something that we've experienced for generations and generations, but it's much more to being an African-American than being a slave. Right. And so just how, again, looking in your family, speaking one by one, uh, one thing that we would do to help that uh, is recording uh, seniors in the family, listening to their stories, having story time within the family, but getting with your family to try to rebuild the narrative uh, to help uh, the other generations, which is very, very important for the younger ones uh, to really stay connected to who we are because it's so, so much uh, that African-American experience has offered us on being resilient and powerful uh, and who we are and, and our identity. And those lessons really need to be captured. Absolutely. And so that, again, I just wanted to, to, to mention that and start that off, but it takes, the, it takes someone taking the initiative to want to keep the family of origin and the narrative. Uh, in your family, but it's strength and power in that. Uh, this is Margie Wilson Cofield, Dr. Nubia Alexander. And listening to you, um, when we know our history, then we can talk to our doctors about it, our professionals, so that we can protect our health and protect our children. I think of back to slavery. Um, my father was born in 19, what, 21, and I think my great grandmother was you know, a baby from a slave mother. So which meant the eating habits that they had, you think about the food that was given to our ancestors during the time of slavery. So, and I'm gonna mention some of them, pig's feet, pig's ears, all of those things. So therefore they're passed down generational. They did not know that their health were being, uh, the health was being affected negatively. So now that we know at this time, then once we get the resources, we can talk with our physician and find out what can we do to eat in a healthy way so that we don't get high blood pressure, diabetes or whatever. And then we can prepare those foods for our families. And then we can break that tradition of eating food that's uh, not healthy for us. So that's the view that I see. And then also, uh, what can we do as far as the community? Uh, we need to go out to where the individuals exist, people of color exist. Going out to people 
who are colored exist, going to the churches, going to community events, going to organizations, meetings, and then by going to where they are and talking about the problems that exist, then that means that they can feel more at ease in talking with us. So you have to, if the, if, if the problem doesn't come to you, we go to where the problem exists, where the people exist. And then they can pass that on to uh, people in their churches, uh, people in their communities, uh, even have health fairs in the communities uh, to bring awareness to them. So go to where the people are and say, listen, we know that this existed in your family in the past, but this is what you can do to break it. Uh, I'm Edna Hawkins Hendricks, and yes. I want to, can you hear me? Uh, and I want to say that I am a cancer survivor. Um, my mother had cancer, and I didn't even know I had it until my mother went to the doctor, and she was diagnosed with cancer, and they said, well, we need to check your whole family. And we said, well, she's the only one that's had cancer, so... Um, we all took the test. I'm the only one that came back that had cancer. And it was in the advanced stages to the point that I had to have surgery to have the cancer removed. So then we did tests on my daughter and found out that she had polyps. So it was very important. So I started going back and digging into my family history. And I found out there was cancer on both sides. So now I... I just tell everybody, you need to check your family histories because had I known that, I could have caught mine so early and my mother could have caught hers so early that we, we didn't have to go through all the surgery that we had to go through. So that's why it's very, very important. And I, I tell everybody, when you're out here doing your genealogy now and you want to find out about your family tree, while you're digging in there about that family tree, check them in there about the health situation of your family as well. So those are two, so two things that you need to be looking for, the genealogy part and the health part, because that is going to promote your survival and learn your history, and you're going to live longer if you know that history, so that you can you know, look through your family tree and see what is there and see what everybody died of. People think it's morbid to be looking at death certificates, but it's not because you're helping yourself. You're helping others when you look back and see what's been going on in your family tree. Thank you, Edna, for bringing that point up. One of the things that I've noticed, um, I use Ancestry for a lot of genealogical research, and I have noticed that um, Ancestry is starting to put traits in there, and there's they're expanding into medical traits. And I know that there is a lot of concern among people uh, about getting tracked because they, they're fearing, uh, and in some cases rightfully so, that insurance companies may charge them a higher rate if they know that they have certain types of conditions, predispositions in their family. But at the same time, you need to know what those predispositions are and whether or not you have um, a family history of, of cancers. Uh, if you have, for example, a family history of lung cancers and you smoke, um, you are playing Russian roulette with five bullets, five bullets, not just one, because you are a lot more likely to get cancer if you have a family history of it, uh, of, of some form of lung cancer or mouth cancer or throat cancer, if you have that history in your family and you smoke, there are people who get lung cancer who don't because they're being exposed to uh, some carcinogens in the environment in which they live and don't really realize that. So Edna, you brought up such a very, very important point. And I know that there was a question um, that was posed early on about Black workers in the Newport News shipyard giving money, um, donating money to the Riverside Hospital. And of course, in the 1960s before, um, not only the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act, but before a lot of 
cities, especially in Virginia uh, and institutions actually began opening up, we really would not begin to see an opening up of facilities until really the, almost the end of the 1960s. And these individuals were denied access. Uh, this is part of perhaps the legacy and history of uh, discrimination is one of those environmental factors that has um, uh, influenced mistrust, influenced um, people's behaviors when it comes to healthcare facilities. Uh, and I think it's something that we really need to make sure that we not only know about, but can transcend to some degree. Um, I wanted to open it up. I know we just have a few more minutes uh, to one more poll, if we could, and, um, and then some final words from all of our panelists about solutions. Um, they've already contributed some really important ideas um, that we'll talk about in just a second. But this last question on advocacy, what are you going to do to be a, to be a better advocate for your own health care. Select the one that you think um, is the best answer. Do you find a health care provider you can trust? Do you make a wellness plan? Advocate for accessible health care institutions or even all of the above? Please go ahead and select. And I want to, um, uh, in looking at the screen, these are some of the points that our panelists have made. So many, all of them actually have said, find someone you can trust. Create a wellness team for yourself. Create a wellness plan. Examine how you eat and the family food and cooking traditions, as well as reframe your language about healthcare to a language of empowerment. Write down the questions that you want to ask. Don't wait until you're there in the uh, healthcare provider's office to try to remember because often people are afraid when they go in or nervous uh, or they get distracted. So write down those questions. Um, but for our panelists, what are your thoughts, your closing thoughts about solutions? Can we start with Dr. Bradley? Oh, sure. Um, I think, well, all of these um, and significantly changing our mindset as to how we approach our health, just as how we want to look good on the outside, you have got to look and feel and be good on the inside. The whole adage that you are what you eat is true. If your family history is of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, we now know those are preventable, particularly with a cancer diagnosis. When I was in med school, we had to have the two hit theory. You have the gene, yes, but you gotta do something on the outside to turn it on. So if you don't do anything or you do so many things to actually turn it down or even turn it off, like the things that we recommend with your eating, your environment, your lifestyle, your sleep, your exercising and decreasing stress, you can actually stay healthy and be healthy and be good on the inside and the outside. Thank you, Dr. Fanning. I was going to add, uh, if anything, recognize that uh, you are an instrument of change, but it starts with you uh, wanting to do better for your own health. And so recognizing to ask questions, to develop your own well care uh, plan, uh, and know that you are a lifelong learner of change. This is not going to happen overnight, right? But it's going to start one interaction at a time, you know? And so just kind of remember that and starting with nutrition uh, and just what you understand about um, eating, right? And recognizing and seeing, uh, begin just to take an assessment of, of how you do in your family. Uh, it's a start. And um, just again, knowing that this is a lifelong process uh, and it starts with how we think about uh, how important we are. And we are very valuable instruments in this culture. Thank you so much. Mrs. Cofield. 
What can we do as far as bringing about solutions? First, take charge of our own health. Get regular checkups. Back to what many of you have said, eat healthy and prepare our food in a healthy way. Some people may not get, get screenings, but we need to have screenings for mammograms, colonoscopies. Don't be afraid to do that. Have some type of relationship with our physicians and that's building that trust between ourselves and the physicians. Another thing, sodium. Any of us don't read the package. You have to watch your sodium intake. <laughs> you know, what goes into your body because that can affect your stuff, your bodies in so many ways. And being able to exercise. Uh, I'm guilty. I have not been exercising as I have in the past. So my doctor finally said, but Margie, Mrs. Cofield rather, you can do chair exercises. So that's what I do. I play my little music and I do my little chair exercises. So we need to exercise also. And bringing about solution back to something I said earlier, where we have people of color that may not come to us, then we can go out into those areas, as I mentioned for earlier, the churches, community civic leagues, community events, the organizations, talk with them. And when you come into a church or when you come into that organization, the individual begin to feel more comfortable with you. And then they can open up and you have a time for them to let you know some of the things that they have done. So, oh, I didn't know I was not supposed to be eating that or whatever. Oh, I didn't realize that I could go to a doctor to check for this. But all of those things, but being able to take charge and then reaching out to those who may not come to us in order to help them. Thank you so much. And Edna, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I would like to say is to come together as a family unit. Sit down, talk about your health care needs, and then make that checklist and then check them off. And you'll become a stronger and healthier family. Thank you so much. And Stephanie, I, can you give us the uh, report on what our poll said? Certainly. All right, so to begin with uh, what we thought the most urgent issue was, uh, our, almost 50% of our audience thought that access to healthcare was the number one issue, uh, followed by access to, uh, to health insurance and then COVID-19. Uh, I think we're really seeing a shift. If we had asked this question maybe six months or a year ago, it might have been quite different. But I know many of us have probably experienced um, the difficulties getting doctor's appointments or particularly urgent care and emergency room care uh, because of the burden COVID-19 has put on the medical system. And so it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, maybe the straw or the, the bale of hay that broke the camel's back. Um, all right, our next uh, poll, our second poll, when we talked about trust, um, that it looks like actually our audience is pretty trusting of the medical of their healthcare providers. Uh, Fifty percent was mostly, and thirty percent absolutely. So eighty percent of us are reasonably trusting in our medical providers. Um, the people who answered sort of in a little bit maybe have some food for thought for today, um, and that was great. Everybody who was on the call when that. Uh, Pull was up, responded, so it's nice to have, see um, a great feedback. Uh, and then for our final uh, one about what are you going to do, um, a lot of people, 70, almost 70% 70 said they were going to do all three of those things, right? Find a healthcare provider, make a wellness plan, and advocate for accessible healthcare institutions. Uh, I know I, I had answered that I was going to make a wellness plan, so... Uh, all right. Uh, we also have a couple of comments from the audience. Um, one that um, a really important reminder that a lot of the health risks that we're talking about for cancer and other um, chronic health conditions like heart disease and diabetes are also comorbidities for COVID-19. So that if we address some of these um, health risks in our own lives, that we can lower our risk of both complications of COVID-19 and other uh, health issues so that, you know, this is not, you have to fix every problem on its own, right? We can take steps that will impact, um, you know, multiple uh, risks in our lives. And also that um, 
telehealth, I, um, that telehealth can help bridge some of those access gaps uh, in communities where um, there aren't doctors right in the neighborhood, uh, the increase of smartphones and the use of um, Zoom and other uh, virtual spaces um, extends to medical care as well. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. I want to thank all of our panelists for a really dynamic and interesting discussion. And as we have said, as Hillary has said, uh, we are going to be having more of these discussions uh, for this year. And I'm going to hear the, some of the save the dates and I'm going to hand this over to Hillary to tell the audience a little bit about how they can access this recording um, and share it with people that you would like uh, to uh, learn a little bit more about this yeah. particular topic. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to the entire panel. This has been enlightening and I love how many great action steps everyone's ready to take um, to take charge of their health. Um, as you can see, our save the dates. Um, we're just super excited that this, uh, what was once an annual talk is now a quarterly series. Um, so congratulations on the, um, the first edition of the new series. Uh, our next talk will be June 16th. Um, we should have some marketing and registration links out um, in the coming month or so for that. You can always go to museums vb.org and on that page you will find the links when registrations open for each of these talks um, and you should be able to find the link to the YouTube video once um, NSU and Virginia Beach are able to put the YouTube video link up. Uh, I think last year there was maybe about a week or so in the in the week and the link to YouTube became available but the recording of this session will be available on YouTube and uh, accessible through um, NSU and uh, particularly through the Virginia Beach History Museum. Uh, you can uh, join us on social media and also see where we share out the, the link once the video is available on social media as well. Um, you can look up Virginia Beach Cultural Affairs or Virginia Beach History Museums and follow us there uh, for access to the videos after the event. Thank you. Thank you all again for attending our event. And here are some links. Um, and I would like to especially thank uh, our folks here at Norfolk State University for continuing to be advocates for the health and well being of our community. I uh, want to thank the Virginia Beach History Museums for their push uh, in getting us involved with them as well as the Princess Anne County Training School, Union Kempsville uh, uh, Museum for um, really bringing this information and knowledge to the community. And we look forward to seeing each and every one of you in June. Please be sure to share with your networks. We will push out the link once it's there for everyone who registered for this webinar. Thank you all so much for attending. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And thank you panelists for an engaging discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.